I'm Amy, sex educator, somatic sex and relationship coach, and sex shop owner. And I'm April, VP of an international high-end pleasure products company and boss queen sex toy mogul. We're best friends who make our own rules about who we are as sexual beings. With everything from how to be a badass in the bedroom to top tips for bringing your relationship to the next level, we have something just for you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com. Hello, everyone. Hey, y'all. How you doing today, Amy? Eh. <laughs> I've been better. I like your honesty. It's been a long week. Ugh. Mercury's going to go into retrograde tomorrow, too, when we're recording this. Does Mercury go into retrograde every summer? Because I, I swear every July and August, Mercury's in retrograde, and my life turns into quite the chaotic mess. It, it happens about three times a year. I think last year it was four times. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's definitely summertime. Well, I'm pretty over it, but I'm hanging in there. And um, yeah, it's just not the most shiny day in my life. But um, I don't really feel the desire to go into it. I've been getting a lot of support and going into it with a lot of people. So I'm sure you all hear about it someday, but today is not the day. Don't worry, I'm not pregnant. Um, <laughs> no babies. So but even we do the work and we still have to go through some shit. Oh, yeah. And when, right when I started going through some shit, I called my therapist and I was like, I need an emergency, emergency session with you. And now I need to see you once a month <laughs> forever, basically. <laughs> I have an EMDR therapy session this week, too, which will be my first time doing EMDR therapy in which I recommend to people with trauma all the time. So I'm looking forward to experiencing that, but also to work on some of the deeper stuff that I've been seeing in my life, you know, some issues from childhood that, um, there, it's not sexual trauma. It's more like abandonment stuff that I haven't really given the time of day to like really go into. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, on a pleasant note, uh -huh. Margins <laughs> wine <laughs> came out with a new wine. Uh -huh. It's a cab franc and that could make you happy for a moment. Oh my God. So I had it. It's amazing. It's so amazing. And, and all of a sudden all my problems are gone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wish it were that easy. Um, well, at least you can drink nice wine. It's so good, though, y'all. If you are not into wine, you're into wine, you check out uh, marginswine.com, and that's M-A-R-G-I-N-S wine.com. The winemaker, her name's Megan. She's wonderful, and she's also offering Shameless Sex listeners, that's you, 10% off when you buy three or more bottles. Just enter the code SHAMELESSSEX10 um, when you check out. But if you buy six or more, which is a half a case to a case, whatever you want, which is what I usually use per week, um, you get 15% off. Use Shameless Sex 15. Um, and if you maybe aren't in the position to buy wine right now, but you want to later, sign up for her newsletter. She doesn't send out very many. It's not going to flood your inbox like every other thing like spam central it's rare just when she has a new release she sends out but go to marginswine.com and sign up for her newsletter mm, it's really good everyone and um we're not just saying that because april's a wine snob and um i think anything that she says is good i put it in my mouth it's obviously good because she said it <laughs> from placebo effect but this really is amazing wine so ch definitely check it out. We're going to answer a sex question. It was sent to us on April 23rd. We're a little late. <laughs> so here we go. This is from a dear listener. Uh, we'll keep their name anonymous, but they say, I am 15 years old, and I was recently a fuck in a fuck buddy relationship with an 18-year-old guy. Before this, we had talked about and dated for about a month and then decided to just fuck due to things that were going on in both of our lives. This is my first type of fuck buddy relationship, and I ended that relationship about a month ago because I had developed a feeling of love for him and still do have those feelings, and it wasn't feeling healthy, and it was breaking me down and making me depressed. Did I do the right thing? Um, okay, so I'm not a big fan of... Uh, regulating the law and um, but I but what I just will point out that there's like some legal issues there already but um, I don't necessarily fully believe that the legal issues make sense so I'm not going to go too deep into that but um, and then I'll hand over to April because she she has some opinions opinions as well um, 
Yeah. So if you're in a fuck buddy relationship and that's the established setup of it because one or both people are not prepared to be in a serious relationship and you start to develop really intense feelings, you know, the choices are to just stuff them and stay in the fuck buddy relationship to share them and continue the fuck buddy relationship and probably feel a lot of attachment and hurt, which just sounds like what you were feeling or to leave so that you could you can do some self care and take care of yourself. So, which is what it sounds like you did, because you saw that it was breaking you down and making you depressed. Or not making you, but you felt depression over it. Um, so, I think that you made a great choice. It sounds like you chose self care. Um, there's a difference between choosing self care, like this is what I need to feel strong and empowered, versus this is what I'm going to do because I'm scared. You know, making a choice out of love for yourself versus fear of what could happen. And it sounds like your choice was out of love for you because you need to take care of you. And, you know, the way I feel about it, like you don't necessarily leave in hopes that by pushing them away, they'll come around and all of a sudden now they want to be in a serious relationship with you. You leave to take care of you. And if it's meant to be, then it works out. You know, maybe they come to you and say, actually, I am ready for this or I want more or whatever that is. But all you can really do is take care of you and your hurt and your feelings and, um, and I know that it's hard to do in when you're really have strong feelings for someone. So like hats off to you for actually being able to do it. You sound like a strong, very young woman. Um, I don't know if I could do that when I was 15. I think I was maybe a little more compliant. So, um, you're a badass. What do you have to say, April? We're sharing a mic today. <laughs> so, um, uh, no, I know. Um, I say that this is a wise 15 year old for sure. And I think that perhaps um, to this anonymous listener, if you, it doesn't sound like you brought up your feelings to your fuck buddy. Um, and that could be one direction to at least offer it so you can feel like you've done everything in your power to be like, hey, I'm having some feelings here. I enjoy our fuck buddy. Uh, situation. I am having feelings for you. How do you feel about that? Um, and perhaps you'll receive maybe more than you thought, or perhaps it'll just be like, no, I'm cool with the fuck buddy shit. And you could be like, excuse my language, by the way, you're 15, but you've heard that before. <laughs> um, but, uh, I think that if, if either way you walked away and I think that takes a lot of courage. Um, and I don't know, yes, when I was 15, I was terrible about walking away, uh, especially things that felt really good to me at the time. Um, I really would go all in. So I think that's a super mature way to be. And, and I think that you have the makings to be an awesome partner and to be an awesome fuck buddy. Um, and I say that you did the right thing. If you're feeling emotionally still sort of um, attached to this fuck buddy, perhaps it deserves a conversation with um, with him and go from there. Yeah, I like, I'm like. i glad that you said that about the having the conversation. We've done so many episodes on how to have those really tough conversations about feelings and hurt. And so it sounds like you are um, an avid listener. So um, continue to listen and check out those episodes. There's, I feel like every episode we kind of talk about it at some point, but... Um, yeah, yeah. Sharing. And that's another thing too. I mean, when I was 15, sharing my feelings was like terrifying. And especially as a woman, not wanting to be like the hysterical woman. And by the way, I don't even know if this person said they were a woman. I just kind of made an assumption. Um, so if you're not a woman, I'm really going to apologize for making an assumption. Yeah. I mean, your email address, you might be a woman. Maybe. So we're going to go with a maybe. Um, so anyways, I think that it's just, it, it is a, it is a tricky thing, especially when you're young and still figuring it out and learning how, that how to communicate about sex and what do you even want as a sexual being. And, um, at the end of the day, if you can communicate the feelings, like April said, that's really helpful. Um, and for the most part, the self care piece and really taking care of you and what you need and being clear on that and voicing that and standing for that. Um, is such a powerful and important path that most young people are not on or um, taught. So I don't know who taught you that when you feel the hard things that you need to leave and take care of yourself, but thank that human. <laughs> they did a great job. Um, 
All right, we're going to leave it at that. Yay, we answered a sex question. We only have about 80,000 more, so we'll get to them someday, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but also, everyone, it is um, a very different and interesting and, and very insightful podcast episode. Uh, it's on sexuality and religion and the shame that comes from... Um, from religion even if you don't identify as religious that comes from religion and is is like kind of hanging out and looming in the shadows and still affecting modern day society um, and ways to work with that too so a very interesting insightful episode um, and I'm sure that you will all learn something new and um, we have plenty more coming up. We have one coming up about uh, dating, which is going to be really interesting from um, Dr. Hernando Chavez. Um, so da- like modern day dating for all you single folks. And we have another one coming up that is actually a little bit about like sex and history, the history of sex with a historian. We're doing a dual release and it's not just about that. We go all over the place with shame and all that, but he's a really brilliant historian and he actually knows some really interesting pieces about what sexuality looked like back in the day. So stay tuned. Lots of really interesting things coming up. We love you dearly, but we're not leaving because it's episode time. All right, everyone, it's time for our episode as promised. But first, I will read you a little bio about our wonderful speaker. So Andrew Josco was raised as the son of a minister in a Pentecostal Christian church in New Jersey, studied at the Evangelical Christian Wheaton College and obtained his Master of Divinity from Princeton Seminary. While religion was his life's passion, Andrew suffered greatly from anxiety, depression, and guilt about his sexuality. After a slow, painful process of awakening and denial, Andrew left religion and awakened to a new experience of spirituality through secular humanism, meditation, psychedelics, and sexuality. His writings about exposing the trauma of religion, awakening spirituality, and healing sexuality can be found at lifeafterdogma.org. Welcome, Andrew! Yay. Hello. Hi, Andrew. What a phenomenal uh, bio. (laughs) Amy nailed it, too. (laughs) Way to read it. (laughs) (laughs) I struggle with the bio sometimes. All these new words in there. (laughs) A lot of them I know. So um, awesome. So so happy to have you here. This is very much aligned with, you know, what we do. We're constantly talking about uh, shame and sexuality. And I know that that's a big piece um, that shame is coming from. Religion, whether or not we like to admit it, even if we're not religious, that um, a lot of the stories and messages that we get about sexuality are still based on um, religion from years upon years ago. That is just still somehow looming in um, in like the un- underworkings of the inner workings and underworkings of, of society. So um, can you give us a little tell us a little about your religious upbringing and how it affected your sexuality? Absolutely. So I grew up in the church and my parents started a church uh, pretty much right after I was born. Uh, so I grew up in this very fundamentalist, rigid framework. And uh, by the way, fundamentalist religion is the majority ideological system in the world today. I think sometimes people don't realize that and think that I'm talking about something that's really extreme and out there, but it's several billion people in the world. Uh, so in this system, sexuality was was is tightly controlled, and uh, just having a an unsanctioned thought or emotion was considered to be bad or sinful. Uh, so, anything anything that's done or or thought outside of marriage is is considered to be wrong and even worthy of of going to hell forever. So I grew up thinking that my penis had the power to throw me into hell. Mm. Poor penis. I know. I know. And poor you. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, but but this is really really normal teaching in uh, evangelical Christianity today, uh, which is really most churches in the U.S. It's estimated about a third, about thirty percent of uh, of I, th- I think Christians in the U.S. or even people. I I, I need to get my. Uh, stats correct, but it, it's a very large percentage of people in the U.S. And I grew up in this heavily religious system. I was really, really committed to it. Religion was my entire life. Uh, we had to please God in every respect, in our career, in the way we spent our time, and the way we thought. And uh, so eventually I ended up realizing that I was really miserable. I was really depressed. I lived just in, in tons of fear, and I didn't know why. And 
I just said to myself, I need to get better. I need to get happy and healthy and I'm going to do whatever it takes. And so that desire to get better led me to the slow, painful unraveling process where I began to see that uh, some of the teachings in the Bible were really at the root of my experience of fear and shame. And that led me to ultimately leaving religion. What were the teachings? Like which specific um, messages would you say that you received that that uh, created this this shame. I think that uh, judgment is one of the core concerns of Western religion. Uh, a lot of it is is an a, is an attempt to answer the question, how will justice be served? And if you look at the roots of religion, religion started out married to politics. There was no separation of church and state. The separation of church and state is really an in, a recent innovation historically. Uh, so the legislation of sexual morality uh, was was really the job of the government um, because it was it was a question of well, how do we protect our citizens? How do we protect our people? And uh, is someone committing adultery? Uh, could be you. You could see that as a crime, or or people would would raid villages or or have wars, and then uh, take the other people's wives. So in this context, sexual morality was was really a political concern. Um. So there, it, really, sex got blown up to be this kind of huge thing with all these punishments, where it became had eternal consequences attached to it. And uh, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, one of his most famous teachings, links sexual thoughts and fantasies directly with being punished b uh, by hellfire. Mm. He says that if you lust after a woman in your heart, if you've, if you've looked at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart, and you, you could be in danger of the fires of hell. Uh, so I grew up from an early age associating having sexual thoughts and fantasies with being burned with fire eternally. And uh, so you, you have literally the, the most unimaginable fear imaginable associated with just having a sexual thought or emotion. And imagine what that does to somebody going through puberty as a teenager. Oh, yeah. You can't control those thoughts. They're going they're going rampant. <laughs> yeah, it's it's horrible. It's it's feel really shame miserable. and just getting like um, an erection. I mean, oh yeah, man, oh my goodness, so <laughs> sad. Absolutely, absolutely. And not only that, uh, having a nocturnal emission was a big deal too, because we had a, a th we were having thoughts and emotions, right? We were having sexual fantasies in our dreams, uh, and so even though we couldn't control it, it was still kind of uh, in this unsanctioned territory. So what we had. We have these these things that go on in the church called accountability groups and accountability partners, where you confess your sexual sins and, and fantasies to each other. It's kind of like Alcoholics Anonymous or something like that, like a support group for people who are sexual, uh, which just so happens to be everybody. Everyone. <laughs> yeah. 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 Is, come on. <laughs> and, and so sex is is uh, is is really taught like it's a disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're shamed for our, our most basic humanity, our most basic human drive uh, is, is taught that it's, it's this kind of, it's temptation. Uh, it's unspiritual, really. It's made to be this unspiritual thing that can cause you to lose your salvation, to lose your soul. It, it, there's tremendous danger associated with it. So, uh, I mean, that's why religion often preaches so much about sex and can be so obsessed with it because there's so much riding on your sexual purity, so to speak. I have a question for you regarding, do you, uh, is it all religions, do you believe, to be kind of sexually oppressing people in general? I mean, I know we, we do, we have listeners that um, are, you know, practicing, um, Islam, um, or is this specific to evangelicals? I don't, I'm really unfamiliar with the Bible. Um, my mom works at a church. She was on the podcast and yeah, I don't know, but, um, I know, uh, being married to, um, a practicing Jew for many years, sex was very, I felt they were more connected to sex and it wasn't as behind closed doors. It was more of an open thing. I don't know what the messages in the um, scriptures of the Jews had, but uh, is it? Do you think it's specific to 
evangelical Christians or Christianity in general, or is it all religions? What do you think? That's a great question. I think that most religions tend to go the way of trying to control and legislate sexuality. And that's certainly the case with the Judeo-Christian religions. And so there are some amazingly dark and frankly immoral teachings about sexual immorality in, in the Judeo-Christian scriptures. So all of these things come from the Bible. Uh, that's where they have their roots. I mean, in the Bible, you find uh, sexual slavery uh, commanded, homosexuality is outlawed, uh, patriarchy is commanded, sexual mutilation, i.e. cutting off a piece of the, of the man's per- penis to dedicate him to God, mm-hmm. circumcision, mm-hmm. Uh, menstruation is, is considered dirty, ritual uncleanness, there's no sex in the afterlife, there's no divorce or remarriage, mm-hmm. women are to submit their lives and their bodies to, uh, to men. It just goes on and on and on, all kinds of things that we, many of us consider to be sex negativity or just outright immoral and that are preached as morality or purity. uh, When I think, I I, I don't see how you could get more immoral than shaming people for being human and for being sexual. But so to answer your questions, uh, these teachings are are in the scriptures, they're in the Bible, Uh, but different religious traditions will, will downplay those scriptures or deal with them differently or say that those were kind of uh, their understanding during the times. Uh, but I think what we're doing is we're essentially, we're taking a textbook that's thousands and thousands of years old that reflect the ideas of people who don't know better, and we're trying to adapt them to a modern circumstance. And I think that can be uh, dangerous in a lot of ways. It's like trying to use a, a medical textbook that was it, it used in ancient times to talk about it today, uh, where it might it might endorse like a lobotomy or something for psychiatry. And we're saying, well, it was, it's a metaphorical lobotomy today. And I'm saying, well, it's still problematic. Mm. Yeah. And, and, uh, and it's, I think with all the things that you just list that huge list of what, what to do and what not to do. Um, so much of that is still here today, even by people who don't with people who don't identify as religious or a Christian or, um, and, you know, I mean, you're talking about the things that are coming out of that that are about, you know, divorce and adultery and um, and circumcision and uh, w- women's bodies should be for men. And like that's I mean, that's still here in, in first in some communities and some folks in a stronger way than for others, because uh, I mean, for us living in Santa Cruz in a very progressive community, it's less so. And it's still it's still here. It's greatly affecting uh, everything in, uh, like this, this invisible way. Yeah. And, and let me, let me just throw an example at you. I mean, religious legislation about sexuality is still pretty dominant in our nation today. I mean, until just a few years ago, it was almost illegal to be gay in our country. Right. And why, why is it that gay people often commit suicide? Who's telling them that it's wrong for them to be gay or that it's a problem? Where did that come from? I mean, it, as far as I can tell, it's it's religious teachings that are doing this. Mm-hmm. And there was just a study done uh, at the Williams Institute at the University of California that said that about 700,000 LGBT, uh, LGBTQ Americans uh, had undergone... Uh, conversion therapy, which is a therapy that tries to change Pray the gay away. sexual Pray orientation. The gay away. Right, <laughs> yes. right, exactly. And and the, and about seventy seven thousand youths will be subject to that today, currently, and and uh, about twenty thousand of those were by licensed professional counselors. Mm. And we look at abortion, uh, the the legislation with Roe versus Wade. That's a big political issue for us, right? Uh, that's that's essentially religious legislation, right there. Yeah. Uh, and, and not to mention when we hear words like modesty and purity, or we look at our, just our, our ideas of, of what's right, like what's legislated on, uh, or, or, or our ratings for movies and TV shows. And it, just our basic ideas of, of like hiding sex and nudity. A lot of this comes from religion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And shame around masturbation and, um, 
Yeah, and the cir- the circumcision. I'm like I circumcision's an interesting one for me because I'm I'm not anti circumcision and that I like people to make their own choices and I just think it's that interesting that people aren't questioning why we're cutting people's bodies like right when they're born and not trying to figure out where that came from. Why is this a practice? You know, why are people told that they're already imperfect and that something needs to be changed in them through surgery uh, from the start? And I think it's just an important um, question or topic to highlight. It's it's really, really important. And, and it's just kind of an assumption that it's kind of the normal thing that you do for males who are born. Right. And it's like, well, why? Where did this come from? Mm-hmm. What? So in, in your opinion, then, uh, I guess I guess we kind of already talked about like the kind of shame that comes from religion. But what 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 can what can people do? You know, I know that you're helping people to work through this as you've done for yourself to work through that shame. But, you know, what are their options? What are the tools? Yeah. And and I'd say, too, a a lot of people who've grown up in these environments have gone through years and years of sexual religious repression, uh, which really I consider sexual abuse. I mean, sexual, spiritual, psychological abuse. Uh, When you're telling someone that their their sexuality is essentially sinful or evil, that every thought that they have, they deserve to be punished or burned with fire for having for me, I can't think of kind of a, a deeper form of sexual abuse than that. And uh, so when, when someone's undergone that kind of, a, of a, a verbal sexual abuse, it takes time to heal. So I think patience is one of the biggest things. And you often hear people talk about this like, oh, this person grew up in the church and now they're going crazy. Because all of a sudden they left religion and now they're going crazy, going to parties, having lots of sex to make up for lost time. I don't know if you've heard of people doing that. And uh, that happens a lot. And there's kind of this fear. And this comes from religion, too, that if you give up religion, then all hell will break loose and you'll just go crazy, impregnate a lot of people, get STDs. And uh, it's just not true. I, I guess what I recommend to people is first of all to have patience uh, because it takes time. There's there's often a, a big learning curve. I, I mean, for me, I lost I, uh, I even the phrase I, I don't like losing my virginity, right? But that comes to my mind. But I had sex for the first time when I was 26 years old, which was really unnatural and I think unhealthy. Uh, and I had so much shame and fear and guilt. Uh, for the first year of having sex, I experienced disassociation from my body. I couldn't stay in my body uh, just because of all the guilt and the fear. And, and uh, it was really difficult for me. And it, it just it took a lot of patience, a lot of self-love and a lot of therapy um, to, to go through. I, there's more I could say about that, too. So <clears throat> are you... Uh, right now you kind of help folks that um, are living sort of that in that shameful space as you lived for many years um, and you have um, the ability to teach them kind of the tools, these tools that are necessary to help move through this. I mean, do you suggest leaving the religion as you did for some of the people that are really struggling? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to tell anyone what to do in terms of their religious beliefs. But I would say that if you're in an abusive relationship, it's hard to get better if you remain in that relationship. And for a lot of people, a relationship with God in the, in the framework of their religion looks just like an abusive relationship. When you have a man, someone called God who tells you what to think and what to do with your body, who tells you you have to confess to him every thought and sexual fantasy you have about another person or another lover, and that that your non-heterosexual desires are wrong. So for a lot of people, it's really difficult to stay in their religion in, in that where they're getting all these abusive messages. Uh, for other people, they, they choose to reframe it. So, you know, I want to respect each individual's uh, way of going about that. Uh, but I think it's really important for us to understand what the issues are. So in order to get better from abuse, you need to understand what was I actually taught? What were the messages? What What's causing this repression and the guilt and the shame that I'm experiencing? 
what are the things I believe and I don't even know about? And I think this is important for us to understand on a big picture in our society, too, for people who are not religious, because uh, Western society was birthed in a uh, in a culture of sexual religious shame. And uh, we're, we're just unconscious about half of it. So understanding what happens is important. Getting out of the context where the abuse is happening is important. Uh, so maybe that means going to a, a church where you're not receiving these messages that make you feel guilty about your sexuality. And then connecting with some kind of therapist or coach or somebody who can help you work through the issues and, and find a way to... Uh, I think the biggest shame about this whole thing for me uh, is that sex is something sacred. Sex is something that can help us experience what you could call the divine, or, or it could be really spiritual. Uh, and so for many of us, it, we're taught that it's unspiritual. I mean, even look at the virgin birth, and uh, Jesus was celibate, and religious leaders are, are celibate, and celibacy or denial of sexuality can, is lifted up as this pinnacle of virtue. Uh, and I think it's virtuous to be like the animals that we are. Uh, we're sexual and, and there's something beautiful and precious and innocent in that. Mm. Yeah, I like that. And that's why I love uh, Tantra, which a lot of people, I mean, it's, it is a spiritual practice and way of being and living that, um, that, and I, I've heard some debate, is it religion? It's not religion, but aside from all of that, it's um, about acceptance instead of resistance and uses pleasure or, or talks about pleasure as the path as opposed to, you know, the the opposition, the enemy. And, um, and, and I, and I think that's, that's helpful for folks. Um, like what you said, you know, getting clear on the shame, the stories, how is it affecting me? Where did they come from? How can I reframe them and maybe find new communities? Because a lot of folks really rely on their communities when it comes to religion too, that that becomes their home and their family. So, um, either finding ways within that to feel uh, safe and seen and heard as you are, um, or finding new communities. And then also knowing that there are other spiritual practices out there that are connected to you know something bigger or to divinity that are more accepting of um everything and everyone um so yeah i I like that and also and we're big proponents of the same as you as working with therapists and coaches like do not trying to do this stuff on your own and i've actually had people who have I've worked with um, clients who have a lot of shame around um, masturbation from their upbringing and the messages that they got mm-hmm. about that. And and they didn't even identify as religious. It was just that they were taught that it was gross and dirty, but that you know comes most likely from religion, even if it's not from your religion. You know, It's someone else's religion that's still hanging out in your life. Uh, that's so, right. So you have a, a workshop coming up in the Bay Area. Can you tell us about that? I do, yeah. It's called Reclaiming Sexuality from Religion. And it's uh, Tuesday, August 14th, Tuesday evening, uh, in Oakland. And this workshop is is basically about what we're talking about right now. It's uh, for people who've experienced trauma or sexual trauma from religion. It could be literal abuse because there's a lot of uh, physical abuse that happens too within religious contexts. But mostly we're talking about sexual oppression, shame, guilt, uh, issues with with being gay and growing up in a religious context, or just people who might be in relationship with somebody who grew up religious and they're struggling with these things, uh, which is really common too. Or you could have a family member just being in the society. So we're going to have the conversation about the issues. I'm going to give a little talk about kind of breaking down all the different categories here uh, of issues. Like we didn't even go over uh, birth control and sex education. And it, there's just all, there's so many different categories, uh, ways in which these issues apply. And we're going to talk about the healing process too. What does it look like to heal and to reintegrate and uh, to to experience sexuality uh, as something life-giving and healthy and spiritual? And how do people sign up for that? Uh, you can sign up for that either on my website, which is lifeafterdogma.org, or you can find the event on Facebook, too. It's uh, Reclaiming Sexuality from Religion. And then, so you are, you, I know that you're offering this workshop, but you, do you also work with people privately as, as a coach to help them? Like, can people, how can people do that with you as well? 
I do. I offer coaching sessions. So you can, again, uh, find me and find my writings. I write a lot of articles about this topic and other topics, too, related to religious trauma and spirituality uh, on lifeafterdogma.org. And for me, this is part of a larger conversation, uh, which is about kind of the psychological harm that one can experience in, in religion and transitioning out of religion. Uh, because uh, like me, there are millions of people right now who are transitioning out of religious contexts. And uh, when you make that transition, it, it can be really, really traumatic uh, because your entire life uh, can be in this, in this system uh, and you can deal with issues like uh, grieving the death of God or having to come to terms with life in the secular world outside of the church, finding new community, finding new career, uh, really starting your life over. And uh, sexuality is one of the biggest parts of it. And I think it's one of the biggest reasons people end up leaving religion, too, is uh, coming to terms with their sexuality. I like what you said, uh, the example about um, the idea of God who tells you you have to tell him about all your sexual thoughts and all the people that you've slept with and all the bad things that you've done. And, um, and I mean, I forgot what else you said exactly, but that like it as an abusive relationship that I was thinking like, God, if I was in a relationship with that person, I would be out of there. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I just wrote an article to you that said, in a relationship with Jesus, you're seeing a sexually abusive guy. <laughs> and uh, I, go over, I go over all the ways that the Jesus uh, in the scripture and in evangelicalism acts like a sexually abusive lover. And uh, it's really kind of shocking, just a lot of the, the scriptures and that are there and like the rape metaphors that God uses in scripture. I've always it's struggled. That's why I've struggled with organized religion because I think like fearing anything that's supposed to really accept you and created you is hard for me. I'm like, why would I fear something? It's supposed to love me. Right? And, and I think, I think for me, that's what's confusing often about religion. And I think that's also kind of what makes something abuse is the mixture. If it was all threats and all fears, it'd be really obvious, right, that, that it was abusive. But it's, and, and when you have an abusive spouse, most of the time he's loving, most of the time he provides for you, but every so often he says, if you leave me, I'm going to kill you. And, 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 and that's kind of, you know, that's, that's, that's what we've got. Right. And, but you stay because you're getting the love, you're getting the good stuff. Right. But, but then there's also all this abuse and fear and shame and guilt that's, that's happening. And, and it, it has a big impact. I mean, people are, I mean, I, I have so many just homosexual, the homosexuality issue alone. I have so many gay friends who have struggled with this or even people who've c committed suicide. And it's like, this is everywhere, and so we need to have this conversation. It's time. So the message is out there to our listeners. If you are feeling um, what Andrew's speaking of and about, you're not alone. There are other people like you, and there are options and choices, and there's support systems. So, um, and Andrew's workshop if you're in the Bay Area, and also. Yes, he, you can be a great resource, I think, for folks out there. And I know that we have listeners in all sorts of different countries. So I think that there are probably, hopefully, resources for them as well, if maybe they're not Christian, but um, feeling the angst of suppression of their sexuality and their religion. There has to be resources. But check out the lifeafterdogma.org site. Um, I think that's a good start. Right, Andrew? That's right. And I <laughs> love to do, I love to talk. I mean, I'm a... I, I still consider myself kind of a preacher reconfigured. Uh, so <laughs> any kind of public speaking or podcast or writing, uh, I'm just happy to to chat. Well, so. we appreciate your time and the info. It was actually quite um, inspirational for me to hear that there's resources for folks that are in organized religions and you know, get erections and are horny. It's okay to do that. It's right. okay. Don't pray the gay away. Just be you. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, thank you for joining us, Andrew. It was an absolute pleasure. And thank you to all of our listeners out there in the podcast land. We heart you so very much. Um, we will see you next Tuesday, y'all. Ciao for now. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. 
and for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com.